Hello, my name is Chris van Schoenenberg. I'm Head of Collections at the Tank Museum and welcome to our first episode of the Tank Museum Workshop Diaries. We started these diaries as a result of the uh, popularity of the Matilda Diaries that followed the restoration of our Matilda II last, over the last few years. And we thought, how can we best tell you what else we're doing in the workshop here at the Tank Museum? As you know, we've built a fantastic new workshop last year, which is really starting being used now properly by the workshop staff and the volunteers. And we have several projects on the go at the moment. And my colleagues, the, the technicians, will talk more about the individual project and what exactly it is they're doing. But we're doing a combination of maintenance, uh, overhauling some of the running systems, and sometimes also restoration work. And it's just a good idea to, to, to start to understand what we're doing. We have 50, 45 to 50 running vehicles in our collection. And this is our period, the winter season, to start working on these vehicles in preparation for Tiger Day, for Tank Fest and the Tank Selection shows and vehicle rides throughout the season. So just having a quick uh, walk through our new workshop and some of the projects the guys are working on, which I'll tell you much more about later on. But here's the Morris Armored Car. It's a vehicle that needed quite a bit of work because it has been uh, operated for many, many years, but only for the, the main big events like Tank Fest, but it never had really had a, a thorough service or overhaul. The engine and gearbox were quite tired and it needed a lot of work. It could no longer be operated. Another wheeled vehicle we're currently working on is the Daimler Dingo. Very similar issues really, operated for many, many years, um, but it had quite a few faults. And one of the problems with these vehicles is because they're so basic in technology and so robust, they'll keep going even with severe faults. So the vehicle kept being operated and operated and it turned out the gearbox was severely damaged uh, over the years. So that's been professionally overhauled now by someone externally. Uh, it's ready to be put back in. Another vehicle that I'll tell you more about that's new in the workshop um, is a track vehicle, a tank, Second World War tank, Churchill Mark III. Uh, that's all part of the Churchill Trust, a uh, collection that has been loaned to us. Um, it's a running vehicle, but it needs quite a bit of work. You may not notice, but we have two different types of collections, running collections at the Tank Museum. We have a historic collection of about 25 vehicles that includes Tiger 131, also includes the Churchill now, the Morris Armored Car, the Dingo, and several other significant vehicles like our Fury Sherman. They only go out occasionally, about two, three, four times a year, because obviously rare vehicles, and we want to preserve them as good as we can. The other fleet is the display fleet. Uh, we have a bit more flexibility of using them a bit more often because they've been specifically collected for that purpose, to operate. Now, we don't want to run them into the ground because they're still historic vehicles in their own right, but we have their duplicates, so we can run them a bit more often uh, like this Leopard 1. Ex-Canadian Forces um, uh, Leopards, we have two of them in the collection. Because one of the problems is with some of the historic vehicles, if they just sit around for an entire year, only go out for tank first, especially with the petrol powered vehicles, that gives all sorts of problems. Think about the battery, the stale fuel, and the experience of driving it as well. So we're trying to spread the load better in 2019. And this fantastic new workshop really helps us looking after these vehicles better. Okay, the first project I want to talk about today is the Morris Armoured Car. Um, as you can probably see, the big hole here where the engine used to be. Um, while we're doing work on the engine, um, Andy is doing some of the wiring. Um, some of it's very old and needs replacing uh, so that we can get all the lights, the horn, and the rest of the electrical services working. If we go over here, we'll um, look at the engine. Now, when Les was here working on the Matilda project, he passed on some of his vast knowledge onto one of our apprentices, Jacob, um, and he's been given the task of rebuilding this engine and getting it back into running order. And he's done a really good job. Uh, we've just got to work on the clutch. Uh, once the clutch is um, complete, then we connect it to the transmission, which is down here on the left. And then we'll run the whole unit and test that it's working correctly. Uh, then it'll go back into the uh, Morris Armoured car. We'll swap that with the dingo so we've got access for the crane and we'll lift the engine on that. Okay.
In order to christen the uh, engine clean room, this is the first project that's going to be undertaken in here. It's a 548 engine used on our rides vehicles. Um, we're very happy that Les is coming back and um, is going to carry on with this project um, and rebuild this engine and get it to run and then connect it to a replacement gearbox. And so we have a spare power unit for the 548s. He'll obviously be working with another apprentice and hopefully he'll be able to pass on some of his knowledge onto him as well. Behind me is one of our Leopard 1 main battle tanks. We have three in the collection, two are Canadian, one German. This vehicle was highlighted as being one of the vehicles that needed the most maintenance uh, during a, a recent visit from the Royal Netherlands Army. So the project's actually been quite problematic uh, due to acquiring spares. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you can imagine, getting spare parts for main battle tanks isn't the easiest thing to do. We've recently found a supplier now um, in Germany. The lead times are quite long, which as you can imagine from a planning point of view can be quite difficult. The plan is to get it out for April half term and um, we're going to keep our fingers crossed on that. One of the most important parts, uh, aspects of a vehicle overhaul is the running system, purely in the grounds of safety um, and uh, reliability. This vehicle came in for full overhaul, so the first thing we did was to uh, disconnect the tracks and use our 20 fun t uh, 25 tonne hoist to raise the vehicle up and place it on stands. This gives us access to all the running gear and we found a number of forts with the running gear, mainly wear and tear um, because this is one of our display vehicles and we do use it a lot. Uh, we use it throughout the season so at the end of the season we do bring it in. We removed all the hubs, stripped the running gear, stripped the top rollers, the hubs were washed out and inspected the wheels were fitted with new bearings and new oil seals and then this was reassembled. Some of the items we found which had to be attended to, one of the torsion bars was um, out of alignment so that had to be removed and uh, turned on the spline to correspond with the remainder of the running gear. We found some cracks in the wheel studs, uh, we're waiting for replacements on them and obviously a number of road wheels did have to be repaired. The entire tank's running system was overhauled. New bearings, new seals, greased and ready to go. As you can see, all good. When the Leopard was designed, its whole idea was for ease of maintenance was top of the list of, of requirements they were looking for. And this is a, a typical example. This was a far departure from tanks before. Um, this is the, the main heart of the tank, it's, we call it the power pack. Every automotive system except the brakes is on this pack. Um, this is a five ton pack. It's an MTU 838, it's 37.4 litres, 10 cylinder, developing 830 horsepower. The engine itself is designed by Maybach, who developed the uh, medium and heavy tank engines of the Second World War. But you can see it's a complete system. Um, for a start, if we start at the back of the engine, this is the fan intake. Here you have your air filters mounted on the side. Underneath the air filters and the fan, you have the gearbox, which connects to the final drive, and we will see that later. Final drives come in here. Fan, air filters. Exhaust outlets. The cooling system is also incorporated into the engine itself. There's no separate reservoir, it's one unit. Um, throttle assembly. Rather than dealing with cables, the throttle assembly, which is actually comes off during the engine lift, is in the hull. Very easy to maintain. In the field, for those of you who have worked on Chieftains, maybe 45 minutes to an hour for a power pack. A Centurion battle tank was 15 and a half hours. This was designed to be changed in the field in 20 minutes. It's very, very simple. All connections are quick release. There aren't many of them, maybe six or seven connections. Here at the front of the engine, this is a guide rail, and we can show you the receiver in the engine hull later. But basically, there are four mounting points here and here. The rear mounting points are here and these fit into the spigots. 
So, as long as when you're fitting the engine, line up the guide rail up, the engine slides down and it will go into the spigots very simply. Now, faults we found with this engine, we had the odd coolant leak, which we've addressed due to our gaskets, mainly on the intake system. We have a couple of broken glow plugs. As you can see here, the ends have broken off the glow plugs, very simple to replace commercial, um, commercial parts. However, the biggest problem we found was these are the turbocharger intakes. These are in the hole, connected to a, a um, hose. Part of the engine takeout system is to release these. When this was released, we found part of this coupling has broken away. Now this is not a standard part, obviously, so um, we are gonna have one of our guys manufacture a new coupling. This vehicle is a Churchill Mark III that belongs to the Churchill Trust. Um, it, is, it was a runner when it came to the museum. It's developed some engine issues, which we've got to sort out before it becomes more reliable so we can run it throughout the summer. Hence, it's in the workshops at the moment and we've pulled the engine out. Um, in order to work on the engine, we're just building this rig up so we can statically run the engine outside the vehicle. And then it gives us much better access to find any faults on it. Um, as I say, it mainly seems to have oil leaking issues at the moment until we've cleaned the engine up <coughs> after taking it out of the tank. Setting it up, once we run it, we'll then be able to identify much easily what's wrong with it. Um, nothing too fundamentally wrong, it's just basically got leaking issues which aren't too much of a problem on a rig, but when it's inside the tank, everything just gets very, very dirty and the oil gets picked up by the cooling fans, thrown through the radiators, etc. Just so I'll give you a quick rundown on the, the rig. We've got a cooling group at the front, um, just two static radiators. Uh, they're not installed as per in the tank. In the tank, they're mounted alongside the engine, such. Because a lot of the components that run, uh, go with the engine, the ancillaries in the tank aren't actually mounted on the engine, they're mounted on bulkheads, etc. We've got this rig set up. They're the air cleaners, which go into the air intakes here. You've got four carburetors. Uh, I should have mentioned, by the way, it's called a Bedford Twin Six engine, about 21 and a half litre, 350 horsepower. Four carburetors mounted there in the top of the engine got a twin ignition system. That's the ignition on this down the outside. It's coil ignition. So cooling group set up. We haven't quite finished the uh, fuel installation yet. Um, one of the problems I found is some oil seals have gone on the fuel pump drive. This arrangement you can see on the front here, again in the tank, these are the oil filters which are mounted on a bulkhead just behind the tank, the uh, engine in the tank. So we've just rigged up this so we can mount the oil filters for when we run the engine and I'm just in the process of wiring up the electrics just for a basic run. Um, it's only got basic instrumentation. A uh, peculiar feature of these engines is that it's almost got two separate cooling systems per side. Got one each side. So there's a, a water pump per six cylinders. It's a flat 12. So therefore you have two temperature gauges to um, show you that she's all running healthily. This Churchill engine's got several oil leak issues. This, this particular example is a, what I would call an indirect oil leak, whereas it's something not obvious coming out of an engine gasket face or, or a sump seal, etc. This is the scavenge oil pump, which mounts on the bottom of the engine like so. But it also has another function in that it drives the main fuel pumps, which bolt on the side there. The issue with the oil, which we found eventually, this is the drive shaft for the fuel pump, which mounts in the housing like so. Yeah, of course I'll... Inside this housing, which bolts onto there, and then eventually that bolts to there, there's a little oil seal. It's a five pound item, very simple to find and replace. The purpose of that is to stop engine oil, which is lubricating all this as well as being pumped, leaking past this shaft and into the workings of the fuel pump which as you can see, you just make out there air greased. <coughs> Shouldn't have engine oil there at all. What happened, the oil seal had failed. It then 
the hot oil had washed most of the grease out. And this is what you call a diaphragm pump. So there's a rubber diaphragm in there, which is operated by a camshaft. In order to work properly, there has to be a hole to atmosphere one side of the diaphragm. The engine oil had washed the grease out, was then coming out of that hole. So every time this operated, which is many, many times in a minute, as the engine, because it's running at half crankshaft speed, it was pumping a small jet of oil onto the floor of the uh, engine compartment. Hence, within a fairly short space of time, it got very, very messy. So, simple fix. New oil seal just arrived. We'll clean all this, thoroughly clean it, reassemble it, put a new oil seal in, and we should be finished. And that should be, that's one of the oil leaks eliminated. This is our Dingo Armoured Car. Uh, the problems we had with this was the gearbox was shot. Um, ironically, it's a Wilson gearbox again, same as what we had in the Matilda. Because um, we were working on that at the time, the gearbox was um, sent out to a, an outside source. Um, they've rebuilt it for us, and now what we want to do, and it's come back, is to uh, get the engine out and remarry it with uh, the gearbox, do some other jobs that we've noticed along the way, um, get that ready for display. Okay, here we are in the engine bay of the Leopard 1. As you can see, this is where the engine pack would normally go. As you've seen already, it's out the tank. You'll also note there isn't much here. This was what I was referring to with ease of maintenance. Basically, the entire engine pack is a complete system with coolant, engine oil, hydraulics, and electrics. So, if we look at the back, here's a brake booster system. This basically gives power to the brakes. Mounted connected to the engine uh, by a quick coupling release. Moving down to the brakes, very similar to your family car, believe it or not. These are your calipers. There are four putts per caliper, two calipers per brake. There's 16 pistons on each tank. Obviously this tank is, doesn't weigh more than 40 tonne. It's quite lightweight. It moves at over 40 mile an hour. Big brakes are needed to stop this vehicle. If you look at your car at home, you'll see your brake discs are maybe a centimetre wide. These are the width, probably three inches on a Leopard tank. Vented to allow heat dissipation. So you have a brake this side, a brake this side. Bear in mind this is the way you also turn the tank, you stop the tank with the brakes and you turn the tank with the brakes. Talking of stopping, the transmission which is on the back of the pack. These are the couplings, the muff couplings that go onto the final drive. Now these wind in and these connect to the final drive. So a simple case of winding them in, winding them out to disconnect them. During the maintenance on uh, the hull, we had to renew some uh, seals on the hydraulic uh, calipers. They were leaking a little bit of oil. Moving forward, if you go back to the pack that we were talking about, you had your rear spigots or locators. These are the receivers. So when the engine comes in, you just need to make sure your fronts are aligned, you're on the guide rail, and the rear spigots go into the receivers. Exhaust system, standard. Twin fuel tanks, two fuel tanks for extra range, uh, and that is about it in the hull until we get to the uh, forward section. Now we're at the front of the engine bay, and if you remember back to when we talked about the pack, we talked about ease of installation and uh, retrieval of the engine. I showed you a small V, and this is the locating strip. So when you bring an engine in, as long as you line up the V with this strip, the engine slides down, it's a guide strip, slides down and down and down. These are the front mounts for the um, spigots, the front mounts. You bolt these in from the fighting compartment, bolts come in from the other side. We've seen the rears. Also what you've got here, if you remember, we talked about the damaged coupling, which was that. Here's the good side. Also here you have the coolant connections, of which there are two for the cooling system. You have some electrical connections, that's for the uh, vehicle harness into the engine system, and a couple of extra pipes. That really is as complicated as it gets in here.
Going back to simplicity and ease of maintenance, the Porsche mechanics and designers really did think of everything. This is the pack frame designed to lift the pack in and out. It has a five ton capacity. It's very simple to put onto the engine. You line up the fan drive with the holes. These bolt it down into the holes. At the front, there are two spigots. These lock in and that's it, ready to lift. It gives a dead straight lift. No spanners involved apart from doing up that bolt. Also, when you disconnect the uh, engine and lift the pack, you obviously have to disconnect the final drives. Now, this little tool here is very simple to use. The idea of this is you put it into the final drive, you wind it out, and this winds the coupling away from the transmission, obviously also in reverse. Very simple to use. Into the final drive, that locates, click in, and wind. And this moves the coupling in and out. Obviously, in opposite the other way, withdraw. That is the coupling withdrawn. Obviously, the first part of lifting a pack is to get access to the pack itself. Here you see the rear decks of the Leo. Another marvellous tool. I did say there were three in total. Again, very simple to use. This engages into the rear deck, like so. That engages in the middle. Tighten that bolt so it doesn't move. And this bolt fits in to the front deck. Safety catch on. Release the turnbuckles. They're 180 degree turnbuckles. And that's it on the crane, ready to lift. If you enjoyed that video, please subscribe to us on YouTube and support us on Patreon. Push to engage and turn. And I knew that was going to happen. <laughs>